Let's go. Let's go. Oh, no. Do you want to? Sorry. I'll let you. I'll let you. Next one. I'm excited and I feel relaxed and I'm ready to party! I'm so sorry. You don't need to do that. You don't need to apologize. It's a fucked up female habit. You don't need to be sorry for anything ever. Can you guess what every woman's worst nightmare is? I don't have rage issues! I have nothing to prove to you. When I'm good, I'm very good. But when I'm bad, I'm better. I say when it comes to stardom and Lauren, there are no accidents. Hi, Karen Peterson. Hello, and welcome to Citizen Dame, the podcast where we are reunited and it feels so good. I'm Karen <laughs> Peterson, <laughs> joined by Lauren Humphreys Brooks. At a moment there, I was just like, should I sing? <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it too. <laughs> I will I will not do that. Uh, <laughs> hello. Hi. Nice. Nice to hear your voice again, Karen. No, it's it feels like it has been an eternity. It feels like it it's really been long. So true. Yeah. How so have you true. been? I have been I have been just fine. It is ridiculously hot here in New York City. Uh although it's cooling off, thank Jesus. How have you been, Karen? Um, I don't know. Like why why were you suddenly like not here? <laughs> um, because I'm apparently a jet setter now and I just zipped off to italy for a week or so it was so it was so much fun have you been to italy before yeah i i got to go to to florence this was ages ago this was back when i was a teenager but um yeah i got to go to florence and then and travel through a good bit of italy we did not include florence on this trip but i really feel like this was my first time my first trip to italy i will be back because it was so it was just great it's beautiful um, the people are so nice. The food is amazing. I, I mean, everything you've ever heard about the good things about Italy were totally true. I also think it helped that we went at the time we did. It was like right at the tail end before the high season starts and the weather was was good. It was never too hot. It was just like, you know, I, I, I can't imagine being there in July. I can't imagine being there last summer during Europe's biggest heat wave ever you know it's like that would have been kind of miserable but when we were there right at the very end of of March and um it was it was just perfect and like I I thought I would really enjoy Venice I want to live in Venice (laughs) can't believe I'm saying that (laughs) it was just it was like walking through it I was just like I love this place I want to live here (laughs) but Venice, I am still like mom, dad, you listen to this this podcast. I am still annoyed that we did not go to Venice because that was one of the places that I wanted to go to. And instead we just stayed in Florence. Um, not that Florence was not amazing. I loved Florence. Like Florence is when next time you go to Italy, definitely go to Florence. Karen. Yes. But I really like, I was like, but I want to go to Venice. And somehow we did not go to Venice. And that annoyed me and it continues to annoy me. So I've never been there. As it should annoy you. They should have taken you to Venice because Venice is amazing. Um, Yeah, we went to four cities in 10 days. So um, it we we started in Rome. We went to Cinque Terre, which if anybody has seen Luca, the Disney on Disney Plus, the Pixar movie, um, it's kind of set up there. And then we went to Venice and then we finished up in the, the Lake Como area which all of it was amazing. And it's like, I'm glad we didn't add Florence to that and try to go there because it would have just been really short changed, you know, like I want to go back, spend a little bit more time in Rome, go to Florence and Milan and, and get to spend some time there. Cause Mm -hmm. yeah. So it it was just amazing. If anybody, you know, wants to see some pictures from my trip, I, I have them all on Instagram. So, um, and there's so many more that I didn't even get to. So <laughs> it's just, it was just incredible being in the Sistine Chapel. Like, you know, I went to Pompeii before well, the day that they were all traveling. I went a day early. So I was in Pompeii and it's like these places that I learned about in elementary school. And I'm suddenly standing there, you know, the Colosseum and, and learning more about the, the gladiators and the games and finding out that I didn't know Rome was abandoned. <laughs> Like after the fall of the Roman Empire. And then eventually people moved back in and they started living in the Colosseum. I didn't know that. That's crazy. You know, we went to. That's so cool. Yeah. 
we when we left Venice and went up to Lake Como, we rented a car and we passed through Verona. And um, they have a whole thing like you can go to Juliet's balcony and and all kinds of stuff. And it was like I mean they they really just like feed into this Romeo and Juliet like kind of legend story. They just embrace it, you know. And it's <laughs> it's good. So- <laughs> Juliet's balcony, which I think was built in like the 19th century or something oh, yeah. like that, yeah. specifically for <laughs> like that because G- Romeo and Juliet did not exist. Correct. They are not based in historical anything, <laughs> like just saying that. Right, exactly. But of course, but, if you're in Verona, like, of course you're going to lean into that. Yeah, and they have this whole thing. So they have a statue in this little courtyard underneath the balcony, and it's Juliet. And I guess the thing to do there is to take a picture, like, holding her boobs. And I'm just like, I'm we're, my friends, we were like, we're not going to do that. <laughs> she's 14 yeah exactly (laughs) but it was interesting like being in Verona and learning a little bit more about it and it was just like I I felt kind of I felt kind of dumb that I never understood that there was a very specific reason or multiple reasons why Shakespeare wrote a play and set it there and especially the one that he did with like these warring families and stuff and it was just like oh Verona was actually kind of an important an important place and so there's like a lot more it I don't know it made it actually made even though yes it's very fictional it made Romeo and Juliet have a little bit deeper meaning to me too it was just like oh this is kind of cool just because understanding a little bit more about the political and and mm-hmm. um and like financial or business uh reasons uh behind it so that was really cool and then we went to Lake Como and saw George Clooney's house. So, <laughs> did did you see George? Uh, he wasn't there. Ah, <laughs> <Aww. laughs> but uh, but yeah, beautiful house. <laughs> so yeah, no, it was it was it was honestly a couple of people were messaging me and they're like, "This looks like a dream trip," and I have to say, it absolutely was. It really was a dream. Everything was great. And I, you know, anybody, if you have the opportunity to travel to Italy, do it. It's, it's amazing. So. That sounds like so much fun. Yeah. So, um, should we talk about some stuff? We should talk about some stuff. Cause uh, yes, this is, a, <laughs> this is a film <laughs> podcast. What? Let's just turn this into a travel podcast. <laughs> like we're just going to travel around and talk about it. Let's do it. Let's get sponsors to pay for us to travel. That's exactly. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're back to reality, back to back to good and bad things. And um, there's a new story. It, uh, I saw this on Variety, but it, Variety picked it up from some other places. Um, so Samantha Geimer who was the victim, the 13-year-old victim of Roman Polanski back in 1977. She's obviously not still 13, but anyway, she recently sat down for an interview with Emmanuel Senior for um, France's Le Point magazine. Now, if you're not sure who Emmanuel Senior is, she happens to be the wife of Roman Polanski. So... Polanski's victim sat down for an interview with Polanski's wife. So that's cool. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> and basically their conversation was about the case and Samantha Geimer saying that like she never thought it was really a big deal. It wasn't a problem. She didn't even know it was rape at the time or that it was a crime. And uh, anyway, um, this whole thing came about, I guess, because um Polanski has a new movie that because of everything that has followed him for decades because he fled from justice and has been a fugitive for 40 something years um he he is increasingly finding it difficult to get movies made and he has a new movie that I guess it sounds like so it was an Italian company finally it's called The Palace Finally, an Italian company backed it, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was, uh, 
considered for the can lineup and it was not included in the can lineup. So it's just mm-hmm. kind of a Polanski was able to do a lot for many, many years. Like he was able to get things done, but in the last few years, like people finally ran cold on him. And yeah. So, this well, is but he, I at. mean, even his, his last film, uh, which is about the Dreyfus affair, Mm-hmm. won an award in france like yeah. it's not like he hasn't had accolades and attention and everything you have to remember not not only was he able to do things for a long time he won an oscar yes <laughs> and got a standing like, ovation <laughs> even though he was not present yeah so so like and in fact there there was a period i remember uh, after there's a film that came a documentary that came out about the the rape case um called i'm trying to remember what it's called just uh it was, it was something like, you know, the persecution of Roman Polanski. It was something to that to, to that level, right? Yeah. Um, and and that kind of spurred actually a, a renewed attempt to basically allow him to return to the United States. And it ultimately came to nothing. But um, but I, I remember that. And like, you know, we have we have to remember we're still yelling at celebrities for signing a letter that was essentially like, you know, he should be allowed to come back to the United States. Um Polanski is such a fucking complicated figure. And as I was saying before we started recording, there's this part of me that is almost like, you know, when he passes, and he he's an old man, um, when he passes, I think that it's going to be not necessarily easier, but I think it's it's going to be less fraught to unpack kind of both his contributions to cinema, which are undoubted. And no matter how you feel about him, no matter where you stand on anything to do with him, his contributions to film can't really be ignored, right? He is a major part of film history. Um, and and that that is simply, that's simply a fact. And that is something that anyone who's interested in film, anyone who writes about film has to grapple with at some level. Yeah. Um, but I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be less complicated to deal with those contributions and at the same time also deal with the rape case, also deal with, are very complicated and continuously complicated feelings because obviously, you know, even as you were just saying that um, the attitude of Hollywood towards Polanski and the attitude of the film industry towards Polanski has changed from the 1970s to now. Um, a lot of the European industry, basically when he fled the United States, a lot of the European industry was like, what's the big deal? Like, well, who cares? He slept with a 13 year old girl, who cares? And and it was painted as basically being this like, moralism essentially from the perspective of the united states maybe not so much now uh definitely was not should not have been painted that way um at the time but i think that in a lot of ways this this whole case actually not just it's not really about polanski anymore um at at a personal level it's about the way that attitudes have changed from the 1970s until now and us grappling with the fact that at, you know at the same time the attitudes have changed but they also haven't changed there's still this back and forth there's still this argument going on there's still this issue of culpability there's still this issue of the victim you know samantha samantha geimer has said for years that she felt more victimized by the la court system than she did by polanski himself whether or not that's true whether or not that is you know it seems to be an honest statement on her part um which is not the same thing as saying that that means he is he should be forgiven or that he is in any way justified. It's such a complicated thing that has so many other things attached to it that it's difficult to now parse out what any of this means. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's one of those things where um I mean, I I have no love for for him as a person and I certainly um I certainly wish that he had just stayed and served his time. <laughs> this would have been over decades ago, but that's not what happened. But I, I think one of the things that, that has a lot of people um, frustrated is the fact that this, this just has like, if he, if, and I don't want to relitigate, relitigate the case or anything like that, but it's like, if he would have just, dealt with this back in the 70s even though at the time he didn't understand it or or didn't think it uh this would have been over a long time ago and people probably would generally forget that it had ever happened you know and 
then to mm. to further have Samantha Geimer, the victim, saying, I never felt like a victim. It was fine. It's like, oh. Like, Which they is just not need true. to stop talking to her about that. <laughs> right. It's not true. And even if she is at a point where she believes that now, even if she actually does, like it sends such a terrible message about yeah. what these situations do to 13 year old kids and that it for most people it stays with them it doesn't mm-hmm. go away and so it's like i i just i wish that people would stop talking to her about it you know <laughs> yeah well and and she's she's constantly being trotted out as kind of a a sort of attempt to you know to absolve him at some level yeah Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's, that's one of the problems and, you know, and she can't, and I, I do think that we need to say the victim can forgive her abuser. The victim Absolutely. can say, I have forgiven him. I am past this. I want to move on with my life. And we should allow the victim that ability. Right. And victims that are just, allowed to forgive and also continue to have a relationship with their abusers. Too. Yeah. And at the same time, that should not then translate to, okay, everything's fine. Right. <laughs> we just won't worry about that anymore. So, so like, as at a social level, we, we, uh, as individuals and as a society, we do not have to forgive anything. Right. Um, and nor does she, right? So there, there is a balance. One of the problems, like I said, with all of this is that now we're at the point where, like, like you're pointing out, it happened so long ago that it's difficult to pick apart what any of this means at this point at this moment in time yeah um the this this particular case one of one of the to speaking to you know the fact that this was that she was 13 etc um i recently saw a part of an interview between brooke shields and drew barrymore talking about brooke shields um uh the the new documentary that's out on hulu pretty baby mm-hmm. and it's basically it's a it's a wonderful interview but it's basically the two of them and you have to remember both of these people grew up in hollywood they were child they were right. child stars at first yeah and then they were increasingly sexualized as they got older um and wow. one of the things that they kind of share with each other is this sensation i think drew barrymore even says that you victim blame yourself because you're so young when when you're experiencing something like this that when you're experiencing like this attention this all of these different attitudes, et cetera, um, that you begin to think, well, maybe it was me. Maybe there was there was something that I did and that there is something wrong with me and that I encouraged this behavior from men. I encouraged like things that happened to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, it's really difficult. So you've got these two adult women, right? Who have gone, th- both of whom have gone through a lot of shit. Yeah. um talking about the victimization that they experienced at the hands of hollywood at the, and at the hands of men right and not really being able to completely pull that apart and understand you know where does culpability begin and end where does my culpability begin and end? was i ever culpable no i couldn't have been culpable while i was a child right yeah oh, it is complicated that's the that's the thing i was talking to a friend this morning actually about this and um he was he made a comment about like man the me too movement other than like harvey weinstein me too hasn't really accomplished anything and i was just like you know it's funny i've actually i was thinking about this earlier this week actually um were we talking about this i don't know i don't think we were no Um, i don't think so okay I feel like I was talking to somebody about it, but now I don't know who it was. But anyway, um, so when I was in college, I took this class called behave, uh, Political Behavior. I was a political science major. And um, in that class, there was a paper, I, a research paper I, I wrote. And it was basically like looking at why some politicians are able to survive scandals and others aren't. And... I don't know. I was thinking about this this week um, because I was just thinking about the, you know, some of the people who've been able to kind of escape um, the consequences in Me Too and the people that haven't. And it's, there's, it's not exactly the same, but it seems like there's a little bit of um, 
similarity where with politicians, a lot of times what happens, the ones that are able to, well, this is 20 years ago in our modern world, I don't know, but, um, but the ones who were able to survive were the ones who apologized and like vowed to do better. And then they were kind of able to, to move past it. And the ones who like tried to make excuses or wouldn't own it or would claim that it wasn't them or whatever, they were the ones that kind of got ran out of town. And so I was thinking about that in the context of me too. And it's like, there seems to be um, a little bit of, of where I see a bit of a similarity is it's like in not whether people say they're sorry, but whether they, whether enough people believe that they actually are. And mm -hmm. you have cases like, cause I was thinking, man, you know, we, we get so frustrated cause some like Louis CK just won a Grammy, you know? And, um, and like, I was trying to think of, of some others that they just get to keep coming back. But then you have people like Brian Singer who never acknowledged anything and he's just disappeared. Like, where is he these days? Mm -hmm. You know, and I hope that saying his name out loud doesn't bring him back. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was thinking about that. It's like he never acknowledged it. He never apologized because he claims he never did anything wrong. And he's kind of just vanished. Um, yeah. Similar with like Matt Lauer. He kind of apologized, but like no one really believed his apology. And now he just tries to pop his head up every once in a while. Like everything's fine. Everything's cool. <laughs> and everyone just like beats him back down every time he pokes his head out of the hole. You know, and so yeah. there, there are people who really haven't come out of me to like unscathed um, because we just we just didn't accept that they were sincerely sorry for for what happened or that they actually acknowledged it so they're so not everyone has has gone without consequences and i think that that is important to continue to remember um yeah. especially when we look at cases that broke when i was in italy like jonathan majors <laughs> so sad about this <laughs> Well, let's let's talk about him in a minute before before we go on to because there are other things I think we want to talk about in regards to Jonathan Majors. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I I think that you're probably right. I also think that, and I have said I said this I think the first year of me like when the Weinstein stuff broke basically. Yeah. Is that nothing is going? We believed and we continue to believe that if it doesn't happen immediately, it's not going to happen, and history if anyone studies history or cultural history the actual history of movements if you look at the women's movements and, thing, and things like that any any major movements nothing happens immediately it's not like a movement begins and then everything changes um and right. I, I i and i think that we need to acknowledge that i also think that we need to think about the fact that how things have changed over the course of decades both in hollywood and in culture um how these discussions are still happening and in some ways it's very it's annoying because you go back and you read some of the art some like feminist arguments from the 1960s and 70s like how have we not gone further <laughs> like yeah. how are these arguments still applicable to my life right but at the same time there are things that aren't applicable to my life that these women were having to deal with that their children and their grandchildren aren't mm -hmm. and and it's I think that it's very dangerous to take a linear view of history that we're just always moving forward towards progress um, because that's not the way that history works. We have setbacks and then we move forward. We have setbacks and then we move forward. There's a lot of, there's a circular nature to history. There's a circular nature to culture. Um, but I think it's really important to acknowledge those times when we do succeed. So bringing down Harvey Weinstein is not negligible. That is not something, and I mean, even the other day, I forget what movie I was watching, but I, I put it on and it was the Weinstein Company. And it was from like the 90s or something like that. And immediately it was like, oh my God, like we still have the Weinstein Company, you know, on, on these things, but we're never seeing that again, yeah. right? And the fact that someone like Weinstein was brought down for, by the way, decades of abuse. Yeah. This wasn't is, like a couple of isolated cases. Yeah, is it, it's really important to recognize that. And it's really important to consider the abusive producers and studio heads, et cetera, who 
were functioning in the in the studio era that were that lived to a ripe old age and never got brought up for any of the many crimes that they have undoubtedly committed. I mean, I and and in fact are continue to be lauded as like these great producers, these great studio heads. I mean, I'm sorry, the Warner Brothers were assholes. They were horrible. Yeah. And we're watching places like TCM giving them, you know, all of these actors just say, like, isn't it wonderful? Warner Brothers is so great. It's just like, no, they weren't. Yeah. They weren't. And we need to talk about that. Right. Um, so I think that it's really important to also notice those successes and those times when people are actually held accountable and not just held legally accountable, but held culturally accountable. Um, as we've talked about before, prosecuting abuse cases, sexual abuse is really difficult. And yeah. anytime that that's successful, that's remarkable, but anytime that it's successful at a cultural level as well. So people like Matt Lauer not being able to poke his head out without someone yelling at him, right? That is important too. And so the cultural movement forward, I think is really important to recognize as well. Yes, I agree. I agree. And it's, it's really, it really is important to acknowledge, you know, when, when we see that there are certain, um, even if they're tiny little incremental steps, but when we do see those, those uh, bits of progress, we have to, we have to acknowledge yeah. them because it helps us remember to keep going. I mean, yeah, and we have to acknowledge the complexity of cultural movements and the complexity of, of human beings because yeah. we're, you know, I mean, we were just talking about Roman Polanski. I promise you, I have very, very mixed feelings about Roman Polanski in all kinds of different ways. <laughs> my feelings and my feelings about him as a director, as as an individual, as an icon, et cetera, have changed over the years. Human beings are messy and that messiness is part of what makes us human, but it, it means that it's very difficult to boil things down to we won, we lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Um, so should we talk about a little bit about Jonathan Majors? Let's talk about Jonathan. You know, we're coming back with a real bang here. It's like, oh, welcome boy. back to Citizen Dame. We have not talked about horrible men for a while. <laughs> Oh man. Um I just realized I so I have an article I just I didn't send over. I'm gonna put it here for you so you can look at it if you want to. This is from AP. So basically, um Jonathan Majors was arrested in New York a couple weeks ago. Um I know yeah, the end of people March. have heard about this, but yeah, it was the end of March. It was while I was gone. Uh and he was arrested on charges of strangulation, assault, and harassment. So that's fun. Um, yeah, so a, um, a victim went to police and reported that he had assaulted her. And his attorneys are saying that there's evidence that he's entirely innocent. I don't know how you prove that someone didn't do something, but um, I mean, whatever. So anyway, this is just, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. It's a sad case. Um, I don't know what the evidence is for or against him, but, um, immediately he started to, uh, see some, uh, some unpleasant outcomes that he was in a, uh, he's had a TV ad campaign for the U S army. They suspended that. Um, there is talk. It's n nothing is confirmed yet, but there's talk that Disney will recast his character of King, who's supposed to be the big bad um, in the current phase of the Marvel movies. So, um, yeah, there's I, I don't even know where to start with this one. Lauren. What do you make of all of this? Well, I think that um, not long after his after he was arrested, then his lawyer like also released text messages between himself and the the victim who was like his girlfriend and they do not and basically they're supposed to exonerate him where she's like saying oh it was all totally my fault and it's like yeah that's 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 the language of someone who's been victimized and is excusing their abuser like that's exactly like the it's textbook, textbook. practically yeah. yeah um and and so it was like this is not helping the case i don't know yeah. um but it's I, I I think that it's hard not to be sad. It's 
you know, you you see someone like Majors who has, and, and I think you even discussed this that his his star has been on the rise. He's been appearing in all of these these different things. He's getting a lot of of attention. He's getting awards attention. He's getting accolades. Um, it was obvious that like his career is taking off, and that like this year was really his career beginning to take off. And then something like this happens, and it's just it's sad to it's sad it's sad to see that happen. And it's horrible because again, you you kind of step back and go like, well, there there goes another one that we thought was okay, you know? Yeah, yeah, it is. And uh, I mean, he he really he kind of just came onto the scene all of a sudden a couple of years ago. It's one of those situations where you know someone has spent years becoming an overnight success, and he kind of feels like that because he'd been working for a long time, doing um, doing theater, doing doing all kinds of stuff and then he did a sundance movie in just in 2019 so this is only a couple years ago um that was the last black man in san francisco it was a big hit at sundance yeah it it ended up not materializing as a big hit um independently and didn't do really a lot with awards or anything which a lot of people thought it would but what it did do was introduce a whole bunch of people to jonathan majors and so over the last couple of years he's he's just been building this big career you know and like he worked with spike lee he did defy bloods he was last year he was in devotion which was kind of um it ended up it was that was actually a bigger hit than i thought it was gonna be i thought Mm -hmm. uh it was gonna be for people i thought it'd be a little too similar to top gun maverick but um but it ended up being a big hit and then this year he starts off the year in january with another big like big buzzed about Sundance movie which is Magazine Dreams which Searchlight Pictures bought and they're planning to release in December and there's been a lot of speculation that that could actually get him an Oscar nomination and I saw that movie he's phenomenal in it this situation actually kind of totally changes the way I look at certain scenes of that movie Mm -hmm. um because basically it's about he plays uh Basically, he plays an incel who is completely single minded, focused on becoming a bodybuilder. His entire his entire life is set up around his goal of like he wants to compete as a bodybuilder. He wants to be on the covers of magazines. He's obsessed with this. And um, and uh, I don't want to get I, I hope that people will still have the opportunity to see the movie because it's it's good. He's very good in it, but it's just now it's like everything's complicated. Will Searchlight still release it? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, he follows up from Sundance and he's in Ant-Man and the Wasp, the Quantumania movie, which didn't do so well, but everyone loved him. And it intru- like he already was introduced in Loki, but it like set up his character more and we get get a lot more background about his character because he is going to be the big bad there's an avengers kang dynasty movie coming in a couple of years and he's supposed to be like the big star. he's basically josh brolin thanos in this this new phase of the avengers movies so it's like and then he had creed 3 also so it's like just yeah. a, a big big year for him like these are big movies and now it's at the very least it's it's stopped <laughs> um we don't know yet if this was is going to completely derail him but it's not looking good yeah well and, and this this is where i think a, a career does potentially get derailed that he isn't yeah. a he he's they like say he's been around for a while but he's not established in the way that like i'm trying to think of someone who's comparable <laughs> like I don't, tom cruise i don't know like he's John, yeah, Johnny Depp, exactly. He doesn't have that same kind of anchoring, I guess, um, in terms of the length of his career and in terms of kind of the aware, the broad public awareness of him as right. a as an actor, right? Um, and so, so yeah, it it is the kind of thing that could potentially derail his career and is, you know, and it's, it's I, we're we're also talking about the career of this guy who has assaulted someone, right. you know. And and I think that that's just what that's why I I said it's sad because he is very charismatic on screen. He's a good actor. Um, 
he is kind of that kind of actor that you want to root for basically mm-hmm. um and to find out that he would that he behaves like that that he that he's obviously abusive that um he's got all of these other problems is very disappointing it's disappointing it's disappointing for a viewer it's disappointing for a critic and you're kind of like you know why 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 yeah yeah exactly well and then you get into these like now of course there's other stories that have come out yeah of of you know sort of a pattern of behavior here and then you get a couple of people who are like i always knew that guy was trash and it's like did you really come on based on what you know (laughs) so i don't know it's gonna be interesting to see what happens but it definitely um yeah one of the things that i i thought though is that when this kind of thing happens early in a career it's very it's much um much less likely not that it's impossible but it's much less likely that he will ride this out and come back and be a big star he may continue to still work there are definitely actors who um have been uh under the radar enough that um once they get past their legal problems they're able to still find jobs but uh i don't know i don't know what's gonna happen it's it's gonna be interesting and it is it's mm-hmm. sad it's disappointing it's uh, but also i mean if if he is guilty i'm glad that he is you know gonna have a day in court because not enough not enough victims get to face their accusers in court yeah so um well, let's do, why don't why don't we talk, talk a little bit about Creed, Creed three? three? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because because unfortunately, so Creed three came came out before any of this happened, right? Yeah. Um, I saw Creed three after, so it was oh boy, inter- yeah. So it was interesting, you know, putting on Creed three and being like, and I and at this point, I was like, okay, I know about Jonathan Majors, this, but I've wanted to see this film, um, so I I still want to see. It. It's interesting to see him in this kind of role where he is a very damaged person. He plays a very damaged person. Um, Someone who basically, and and one of one of the interesting things about all of the Creed films is that, that they all do a very good job with is putting Creed against different kinds of boxers Mm -hmm. and really showing the differences in style and the differences in the way that, that different boxers use their bodies, the way that they use their speed, their strength, all of those things. But one of the features of, of I think, really all three of the Creed films is this: is the fact that Creed is short. He's small for a boxer, yeah. um, and so he has to rely on things beyond brute strength. And a lot of his opponents are big men. And this film in particular really shows, I think, the difference not just between their boxing styles, but between their willingness to go farther. And one of the things that I think shows up in in Dame's characterization, both in the ring and out of the ring, is his willingness to cheat, right? And his willingness to try to go through people rather than actually working with them and dealing with them. So it was interesting coming at this from a point where, you know, the things that we know about majors we now know, and watching this film and seeing the way he performs this kind of character of someone who, in a large part because of his circumstances, has become violent and has become willing to use his violence to further his own ends. Yeah, I I found myself a little bit frustrated by Creed 3 because of the fact that I think that it introduces this character, Damien, played by Jonathan Majors, without giving us enough, enough about him. Like, Mm -hmm. I watched it and I was, I'm sitting there thinking, like, I feel sorry for this kid. He was a victim of, you know, a lot of obviously terrible circumstances. And then he ends up in a situation where he goes off to prison and... Uh, it seems like he must have been charged as an adult because of how long he was away. Um, and it's like this poor kid just never had a chance in life. And yet he comes out and then suddenly he's just kind of just the um, yeah the villain of the movie. And it was like, I, 
I just, I just want to give him a hug and send him to therapy, you know? <laughs> well, and I honestly, I, I agree with you. I think that that's one of the weaknesses of the film. The film introduces what could be a really interesting and complex relationship, yeah. right? Between Creed and Damien. And, but it falls into the need, the, the need for Creed to win. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it creates a situation where, okay, we can't root for the other guy right we can't so we want to set up a situation where the audience knows that creed should win the fight and and that's that's what it does so in a lot of ways it does it winds up betraying damien's character and and at the same time asks us to feel two different ways about him right and then yeah. kind of gives us this conclusion where it's like okay the, the i guess the things are okay or something like that but and and I think that it's that honestly a lot of it is because there's so much reliance on bringing the film to that final kind of grudge match mm -hmm. that each film has concluded with. And what this really needed to be, this needed to not be the story of Creed anymore. It needed to be Damien's story. Yeah. And one of the things that I was thinking as I was watching this film, and it's a well-made film in a lot of ways, I think. And it's very well acted. You've got great performances, it's got a lot of really interesting things going on. This was the film where Creed needed to become the Rocky character. Yes. To, to shift basically from being the young boxer who has you know everything on the line, proving himself, his own legacy, all of those things, to becoming the guy who actually helps people along to become those boxers. And you get a little bit of it with his relationship with um, Felix, Felix, with the, yeah. the one young boxer. That's what we needed with Damien. So it needed to not be about, we're going to get Creed back into the ring, but we're going to get, da Creed is going to help Damien get into the ring mm -hmm. to give him an oppor the opportunity that was stolen from him in a lot of ways. Yeah. Exactly. And, like, yeah, and, and so the film and the film doesn't go there. And it I I try to avoid saying like this should have been a different film, but it should have been a different film. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. And it's like the problem is not Michael B. Jordan's directing. This is his first uh his directorial debut, and I think he did a great job. The problem is the story. The script is just it it's yeah, it's not telling the it's not telling the right story. <laughs> And if they wanted it to be a fight, but like come down to a fight between Damien and Dawn, then they needed to have a different setup to that yeah. fight. Because it just like either I agree with you, I think it would have been a much stronger closing chapter of a trilogy if it had if Dawn now retired had taken all of his his skills, his abilities, the fact that he owns a gym and coaches people and and then like kind of use that experience to correct the mistake that he had made as a child by, you know, letting his friend go away for something that he was part of. And mm -hmm. then it would have been this kind of full circle moment. It would have been a really nice ending to his story. Um, and it would have just, it, yeah, it would have just, been such a, like, a perfect that would have been a great trilogy and yeah. or if they really insisted on wanting this to come down to a big fight between the two of them they needed to change what happened when they were younger or yeah. how it was dealt with or something yeah it was it was trying to do a couple of different things at the same time and managed not to do any of them well Right. Um, yeah. And 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 I'm I'm saying that in the sense that like it feels like it's incomplete, right? You you get you feel like that the arc do doesn't work because you, there are there isn't the same experience of stakes like the first two films. And actually, I actually watched the first two films before I saw the third one, um, in fairly quick succession. So I was like, okay, so one of the things that you get in those first two films is what's at stake for Don mm -hmm. in the final fight you know whether he wins whether he loses and we have to remember he loses the first fight yeah and and that, just like rocky and that's exactly. okay because because we understand that he has done what he actually needs to do and he's proven who he is um in that fight and that's important right and this and yeah and this one it's just like but this he doesn't he doesn't have any stakes <laughs> he's like mm -hmm. 
and and you do kind of go like why would you get back in the ring at all like you've proven everything that you need to prove and so they had to up damien's villainy yeah. in order to get to that point where it's just like oh now yeah of course you would go back into the ring because of all of this shit that he's saying and all of the shit that he's doing but because of that it, it completely upends what it what it feels like the emotional arc of the film is yeah um and and it just turns into like it's like oh okay it's so the good guys versus the bad guys and like oh we'll be kind of sympathetic to damien at the end but he's still lost you know all of that mm-hmm. yeah exactly and it's 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 too bad but again not because of michael b jordan's directing he's good and i can't wait to see him do some more stuff i think i think he's got a good eye so um should we talk about a couple more things that we've been watching i think that we should yes (laughs) okay um first of all i just wanted to say again how happy i am ted lasso's back how sad i am that it's the final season probably (laughs) (laughs) um So we do have a couple other things that are on or have returned. Um, Yellow Jackets started while I was in Italy and I couldn't watch it until I got back. But then I had (laughs) three episodes to watch and it was great. (laughs) What are your thoughts so far on the new season of Yellow Jackets? I, I am really enjoying it. I, I like the, um, you know, I like that, the, that they're sort of slowly building the mystery, both in the the contemporary moment with the adults and then also with the, the what, what happened with the kids. I'm glad that they're finally going to certain places. I don't know how many spoilers we really want to do, other than it's like happens in the second episode and it's kind of something we've been expecting all along. <laughs> Mm-hmm. but um one of the things that i was struck by yesterday actually watching the the most recent episode um well, I, I was sitting there going like you know i actually misty is becoming less the craziest person on screen oh yeah like totally. like, <laughs> like in the first season misty was like oh she's psycho she's she's insane like <laughs> and at this point i'm just like shauna's gonna become a serial killer like something <laughs> jesus <laughs> christ and so and i i give so much credit to melanie to melanie linsky for like and she did it very well in the first season but particularly in this season she's just like i will peel the skin from your bones like yes you will <laughs> mom like it, it's it's very much that like that darkness underlying the suburban housewife you know <laughs> yeah yeah like man shauna is messed up but uh yeah i haven't seen this week's episode yet but um so far i'm i'm loving the season i think it's great i love getting to to see some additional characters that we didn't know their fate and now yeah. getting to know like more of who survived is is pretty great um i i guess they they weren't that um quiet about it or whatever like i guess it was more obvious than i wanted it to be about uh, in the first season about like whether there were supernatural elements involved um having that confirmed now like very clearly confirmed that there are elements of supernatural here i don't know how i feel about that has it been clearly confirmed though i feel like it was pretty clear in last week's episode when they showed a certain death scene. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I think that I still think that it's ambiguous. Um, and there, there's certain things that happen. I don't know. There's certain things that happen in this week's episode that might actually reinforce what you're saying. Oh, um, okay. But, but one of the things that I've liked about it is that there are definitely these supernatural undercurrents to it. But I also think that we need to note the fact that particularly in the in the sections with the teenagers, they are all starving and yeah. they're isolated. Yeah. And they are so part of what's happening. And I think that the the first season re- reinforced this really well. And the and this season, I think, is building on that is that they're going crazy mm-hmm. in and, and there is a certain sense of mass psychosis, basically. Yes. Definitely. that they're all beginning to form these stories these impressions these experiences that may or may not be real but are becoming real to not just an individual but to them as a group 
Right. And that's, and part of that is, is the result of, sur- of surviving basically. Um, yeah. I, I'll be interested to see where they go. If they go with some of the supernatural stuff, how ambiguous that remains. Um, I think that it's still fairly ambiguous that there, it, there hasn't been a deep confirmation of yes, there are supernatural elements at work or not and if they are supernatural i think that they're more related to individual characters than they are to like a whole broad experience that's my opinion okay all right that being said there there might actually be something in this next episode that is like exactly (laughs) what you're talking about i'm like oh maybe it has been confirmed never mind (laughs) well i'm just thinking because like in last season we saw the death of one of the adults and this season we've seen a different bird like a like actually seen that play out and that's the circumstances of that i'm like okay this is pretty clear they're confirming that this is supernatural maybe okay (laughs) I don't, right. i'm not buying it quite I'm yet curious. but, okay. but you, may, you may be right and that might be the direction that they're going in okay i i actually hope that they just i would prefer them to make it ambiguous for a long time so well definitely with the the, the last fun. the last couple of episodes i think that they do maintain that ambiguity but definitely something is going on because you know the and i think that that's so the cannibalism aspect right yeah yeah let's just go there let's because it's been teased and set up like you know throughout pretty much the first you just like they ate someone like yeah definitely definitely. um so the cannibalism aspect which i i quite liked the way that they dealt with it it's one of those things that i i'm not i'm not a cannibalism fan i don't really like watching that on film but i think that they did it they gave it enough grotesqueness and enough sort of grossness without making it too much it and they didn't also, just go on oh i was just say they also made it understandable how that happened <laughs> like Although, i uh... wouldn't do it i don't think but but <laughs> like it starts with a girl who a teenage girl who's starving and is pregnant and yes. desperate like she needs protein and <laughs> <laughs> I'm not excusing it, but I just, it's like, I, I think that when you look at this has been months, like at this point, they have been stuck out there for months. They have no idea. They they reasonably think this could just be where they stay for the rest of their lives, you know, yeah. and they're in a really desperate situation. They have, you know, they have no means of taking care of themselves. And, and they also all acknowledge this is not this is not good like this isn't like they're 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 also disgusted by it but they're desperate i i th- see this is actually the one point where i was like i i actually think that this is a slight misunderstanding of teenage girls maybe or maybe it's just my friend group or something but when i was a teenager we discussed like who would you eat first if you had to (laughs) and i remember one of my friends saying well you eat whoever looks the tastiest (laughs) um this obviously not a serious conversation but i i do feel like at some point i'm surprised in some ways that at at some point none of the girls said jackie's dead she's preserved (laughs) <laughs> we're hungry like it, it makes sense i i'm not surprised that none of them went there because i think there's 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 a big difference between <laughs> speculating on what would i do in this situation and then having to actually pull out a knife and help yourself to a thigh <laughs> <laughs> i i did i did like it in that episode in that episode where like they were all waking up uh-huh. and like and i was just like oh she's getting smoked she's like a slow cooked barbecue i was sitting there going like of course it would smell fantastic especially if you haven't had meat in yeah, however exactly. many months and you're starving and you're just like oh my god it's barbecue <laughs> so I yeah I don't know I I was honestly like I feel like at some point this might have been a discussion like at some point and maybe it would be in a in kind of a different context or something like that but that at some point someone might have said like we have meat yeah we do yeah I I just I don't know I think in reality that becomes one of those things you like don't even joke about you know 
Well, I, I've never been in that situation, nor do I hope to be. So. Well, I am never getting on a plane with you because if it <laughs> crashes, I know it's going to happen. <laughs> I'm talking about a body that has been preserved in ice. I'm not talking about like it just randomly eating someone. Okay. Okay. All right. This would not be the first go to. I am saying that in the position that these girls are in for the length of time that they've been in this position. Yes. And for the fact that like they and they the the first few episodes do reinforce the fact that they've been out hunting and they've been looking for game and they haven't been able to find anything. Yeah. So they've been living on very, very little. Well, and I think that's why it makes sense the way that it happens, because then it's like you've got Shauna yeah. who's pregnant and she just kind of does it. She does it in secret. And then the other girls discover that this has happened. And then it becomes like, well, <laughs> I guess we maybe I don't I don't know. So now it, the next, it's, yeah, they don't just jump straight to cannibalism. <laughs> and now the next step is who's going to get eaten next? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I have a guess, but we'll see. Well, uh, speaking of meat, let's talk about beef, <laughs> <laughs> which is absolutely Which is actually not about, about me. <laughs> Uh, yeah, beef on Netflix is actually about a, a metaphorical beef between two people. It stems from a road rage incident. And I love Stephen Yun. I love Ali Wong. And I want them to be friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on beef? I really like it. You know, we, we've been talking a lot this episode about the complexity of human beings. This this show really represents that complexity in in yeah. a very convincing way and one of the things that i i like about it is that it makes you interested in both of them and it it, at certain points it makes you root for both of them Mm -hmm. and also recognize the fact that they're both wrong and that what but at the same time it's a very it's a natural wrongness like i and i think that it all begins with this relatively you know someone honking at someone else literally that's how it starts right and you see the increments with which it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And beca- and it becomes more and more an, an obsession of the two of them and an offshoot of their anger and their annoyance and all kinds of things within their own lives. And I think that it does that so well and makes it so realistic while at the same time also adding to the humor. It, do- it does have humor in it, which I like. Um, and... And to the the sensation as the viewer, as the outsider watching all this, being like, no, don't make it worse. You're just going to make it worse. Don't go there. And then they do. And you're like, please make it stop. Just stop. <laughs> yeah, there's there's this really compelling element of it where it's like, if I were watching this play out, like if I had a friend who was involved in a situation like this, I'd be like, you're crazy. Stop this. Um, but and and I have a little bit of that with them. I want to just tell them both, just just stop, just knock this off. You're you're just gonna go down a road that you cannot come back from. Um, but it's it is interesting. I think because of the fact that we get such a balance of like getting to see both of their perspectives, not not like oh I I totally see his side or her side or whatever. Although it was funny because like the first couple of episodes, I'm watching it and I'm just like I. I don't think she's handling this all great, but I am 100% on her side on all of this, you know? And then you learn a little mm-hmm. bit more about him and it's like, okay, I still am totally on her side, but I feel bad for him, <laughs> you know? And so I'm only about halfway through. I've got a lot more to go, but it's, uh, it is good because you do get to see, like, there are no heroes and villains here. It's just complicated yeah. people who their lives intersected at a time when they both were dealing with some just heavy shit and neither of them was emotionally in the right space for the encounter that they had, which is he starts to back out of a parking space in front, like into her because he doesn't see her and she gets mad about it. She honks, she flips him off and then he takes off and follows her. And it's like everything about that is just like how many encounters like that do we have? in our lives you know i mean i get cut off on the freeway or i accidentally turn in front of somebody or you know whatever like it it happens all the time and this is just 
it just caught them both in yeah. the wrong moment where they they're both dealing with stuff and they have this like they 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 have this these other problems that are happening so this just triggers something in them it's like i can't do anything about this situation that i'm dealing with but i can do something about you yeah and and it's it's really fascinating and then it and then it's interesting too because you have these people that like do terrible shit to each other but they're such generally likable people <laughs> so it's <laughs> <laughs> it just makes it more complicated. I love Stephen Young. I don't necessarily like his character in this, but I love him. So I'm like so conflicted about the stuff that he does <laughs> and like <laughs> where I want this to go for him. You know, <laughs> no Stephen Young, don't do that. Um, well, yeah. I, I, what I also really like about it is that it shows. So it becomes an obsession with the two of them, right? They right. become obsessed with each other in a lot of ways. And it's it's almost a background obsession where it's not like they're constantly focusing on one another, but it every once in a while, like, you know, she'll text him something nasty or he'll do something to her and it just keeps on escalating. But it also shows how that that initial incident and everything that happens after it also affects the rest of their lives. Yeah. And the people around them, right? And it become and they become more and more intertwined. Um, and it's it's really interesting because it it is such a small. It's kind of like a sliding door sort of thing. It's such a small incident yeah. that if she had been one second later or one second earlier, he had waited, you know, a minute, they never would have intersected, and all kinds of things never would have happened. Right. Um. And and I think the show does that really really well and and at the same time kind of kind of showing how otherwise you know you get the impression that both of them they're both under a lot of pressure but that both of them are reasonable human beings who then become this deeply obsessed mm -hmm. with this one thing that happens to them yeah um yeah there's it's, also it's an, really well done yeah there's also an interesting undercurrent too of like, and again, I'm only halfway through, but every time like a neighbor or friend brings up like, oh my gosh, did you see that video of that road rage incident? And people just have all these assumptions. They don't know that like, you know, someone's telling her about it. They don't know that she's the one driving one of the cars, you know, but um, people just make all these assumptions. And I, I was thinking about that. And like, when we see things on the news or whatever, you know, we just make all, we just jump to all kinds of conclusions as humans kind of fill in the gaps in the story of what we don't know and make a lot of assumptions about the people in these incidents. And here it is. It's just two people that were just going about their day, you know, and neither of them is an inherently like evil person. They don't like want to murder each other or anything, but um, it just unlocked something. And, and again like we we either we experience this or we see it happen all the time and just we as humans just make so mm -hmm. many assumptions about other people and their motives and and yeah i i think this just does a good job of of kind of um exposing that or or um just just really representing that yeah and and also what each of them tell the people in their lives about the incident yeah so there and there are certain things that's interesting actually because there are times when I, I i'm nearing the end of the show i think i've got two or three more episodes left um and and it's interesting there there are times we're just like oh yeah she didn't tell her about any of this like how she has no idea that like anything even close to this has happened right um and they're and like it's interesting because obviously as viewers we saw what happened right mm -hmm. they each had their individual experiences of what happened and what they tell the people in their lives or don't tell the people in their lives about the incident and about the like what happens in the aftermath of it is really fascinating because they hold a lot back <laughs> and they yeah. hold a lot back from different people depending upon how close they are depending on on a whole bunch of other reasons um yeah. and it's it's really interesting again it, it comes back to that you know the messiness of human beings of like we don't tell everything to everybody and there there's also a sense that both of them are almost it becomes this little private obsession and to a certain degree a little, little bit of a, a private joy in some ways like 
there's a point in the show where they begin to enjoy harassing each other. Mm -hmm. That it's like a fun thing that they do with each other. <laughs> yeah. Like he's got her in his phone as that bitch. <laughs> and I forget what she calls him, but like there's there's a wonderful scene where they actually interact with each wow. other and and have like yeah. this conversation, just like those are kind of friends sometimes. <laughs> like, I hate you, I hate you too. <laughs> <laughs> I want them to be friends. <laughs> I know there there is this part just like can they just like hang out because I think if they hung out they would be cool with each other <laughs> yeah yeah like if he just could get a little bit of a leg up in life he'd be so much better than her husband her husband kind of sucks true yeah yeah um okay well speaking of messiness I saw Renfield last night <laughs> uh let's end on that one so how was oh, Renfield gosh. <laughs> I loved it so much. I thought it was just it's it's silly. Like I saw some people getting frustrated, like, oh, it's you know, I don't know. Anyway, not everybody loves it. I think it's it's really fun. It's only 90 minutes and it's absolute mayhem and just like cartoony type levels of violence. You've got people getting their arms ripped off and then blood just splurting out. And it's like bright red cartoon blood and it's it's just fun and one of the things that i didn't know and was not was not expecting was um they actually recreated a couple of scenes from the 1931 dracula when renfield is kind of telling his story and it was just like just such a fun element and then the the end credits are full of um like some of those two like recreations of iconic moments from other dracula movies as well as like just kind of replaying little bits of of this one but it's it's just um it's just good it's fun it's it's you know it's robert montague renfield he has recently dracula has become um almost destroyed and so he's been trying to bring him back to health because he just is in this symbiosis he cannot get away from him and so he has found a support group he's been going to this weekly support group um for people that are in toxic relationships and are codependent <laughs> and it's just <laughs> hilarious it's so funny and then just watching watching renfield like from who you know who lived in the early 1900s and was in the great war and, and everything um like that's the version of the character we're going with um and just watching him like try to navigate the modern world and like he he's been around long enough that he he understands things but he also is still very stuck in like like old time like mentality in some ways too it's it's just fun nicholas holt is such a fun actor and he was so perfect for the character I also loved getting to see Aquafina not only play like a fun character, she doesn't, she's not a sidekick in this one. She is a full on like second lead. She gets to be a bit of the romantic lead. She gets to be the romantic love interest. And that was really fun too. I'm like, good for her. And it's, it's just, it's entertaining. Shori Agadashlu is in it. And I love her so much. And she gets to be a villain, which was just awesome. And I just, this movie is, is just a blast. And like I said, it's only 90 minutes of mayhem. And it's, if you enjoy Dracula, if you enjoy just like hilariously violent stuff, like this is, this is right up my alley. I loved it. Uh, you might, you might inspire me to go to a movie theater for oh the first gosh. time in forever. <laughs> like, I, no, what you're describing is very much like exactly the sort of shit that I like. <laughs> <laughs> Nicolas Cage was so perfect too. Like it's, oh, it's just great. <laughs> I hope you do go see it. I hope you do. And if you do, I hope you love it. I, I I I might I might you know I've been thinking about it like that's that sounds that sounds fantastic and Dracula is my jam so <laughs> it'd be a good one for for you know getting back to the theater so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right anything that you've seen that you wanted to mention 
I've, I've been watching a whole bunch of random films. <laughs> I finally saw Cocaine Bear. I don't know if I if we talked Yay! about that at all, we which I loved, actually, I which I loved. It is a feminist masterpiece about totally. a working mother and and, you know, and a whole bunch of cocaine. And <laughs> I, I I really enjoyed it. Like I saw a couple of people complain to like, oh, it's not serious. I'm just like, what the fuck? It's a it's called Cocaine Bear. Yeah. I don't know what you want from this movie other than a bear on cocaine, like, it's, it's, which is what we get. I love delivers the on its promise. I loved the kids. Like the two, <laughs> the two kids are just wonderful, and I think they have they hit just the right note. Like anytime it threatens to to take itself a little too seriously, you've got these two little kids, and yeah, liked loved seeing esteemed actress character actress Margot Martindale. Um, so yeah it was just i i enjoyed the crap out of it so yeah I, i've i've watched that i've watched a whole bunch of different films um recently saw storm warning which is i think part of the the tcm celebrating warner brothers which i i think we're going to talk about later on this month so might hold back on that but it's it's a fascinating film it is on the tcm uh hub on hbo max right now soon to be rebranded max yes. uh <laughs> It's it's really really worth seeing. It's a tough film in a lot of ways. Actually, it's a, it it deals with the KKK, um, and but this this was a film made in like I think nineteen forty nine. It stars Ginger Rogers. It's it's a really well done film. I recommend people seeing it. Awesome. Um, and Ginger Rogers and Doris Day of all people, a very young Doris Day. Oh wow. Uh yeah, it like she showed up on. I don't think I had like missed the cast list or something, and she showed up on screen. I was like, "What the Doris Day? What are you doing here?" <laughs> it's always fun when that happens. Uh yeah, and a very very different role from what one would expect from Doris Day. Um, so yeah, I I do recommend watching that, but I think I want to talk about it when we talk about Warner Brothers um later on this month. Awesome. Cool. Well, I think that's about it. Yeah. Yes. I think that should close us out. All right. Well, we want to thank everyone for, for coming back and listening to us. Glad to be back. Um, we want to especially thank our patrons for helping keep the show going. Um, they are Ollie, Brian, Connor, Estefania, Heather, James, Judy, Karen, Kathleen, Carriotta, Matt, Michelle, Monty, Nanina, Robert, Robert, Steve, Sharon, and Tao. And if you would like to become a patron yourself, you can go to patreon.com slash citizen dame and sign up. We do have bonus episodes. We have, um, you get all of our regular episodes early. Uh, we also have some like buttons and stickers and things that are coming your way. So um, I think everybody who's owed stuff has gotten it, but if yes. not, please be sure to let us know. Yes. I, I, I sent out a message um, a couple weeks ago. If you still have not received something, please, please, please let, let me know. Send us an email or send us a message on Patreon. And if if it has been sent out, I will send more out. If it hasn't been sent out, uh, I will be certain to get it to you. I think that I've got everybody. Okay. But let me know if you don't have your things. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, and of course, we have our Zazzle.com slash Citizen Dame pod and our Ko-Fi, co-fi.com slash Citizen Dame you can find all kinds of stuff on our website, citizendamepod.com. Um, I'm going to have a full review of Renfield and also Mafia Mama, which I saw this week with Tony Collette. Um, and we've got some other stuff coming your way as well. So um, be sure to go there. And you can also, if you have questions, comments, thoughts, um, want to send us stuff, you can email us, citizendamepod at gmail.com. And you can also find us on the socials, of course. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Citizen Dame Pod, Mastodon, Citizen Dame Pod at Mastodon.social. We're not using it yet. It's just we're prepared in case Twitter dies. And then also Letterboxd is at Citizen Dame. And on Letterboxd, we keep a running list, try to keep it up, of all the movies and stuff that we talk about on the show. So you can find that and you can find links to um, reviews, all kinds of things that we're doing there. So. Um, but you can also reach out to us individually. Lauren, where are you? I am on all of the various socials at LH Business. And I am on them too, at Karen M. Peterson. So that's going to be it for this week. We're so glad you're back. We're so glad we're back. 
and we will catch you next time. Bye. Would you like to introduce yourself to the group? I'm the Prince of Valencia. Some call me the Dark One. Others, the Lord of Death. <laughs> However, to most, I am known simply as... Redfield's boss! <laughs>